Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of colors and the singing of the national anthem. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats.
Good morning. My name is Ho Ni. I'm the director of the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. And along with my co-host, Ray Firstnow, the director of the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the NRC's 31st Annual Regulatory Information Conference, or what we lovingly refer to as the RIC. You know, I noticed the displays this year, and it seems like the people that take the artistic liberty in designing it are really keeping up with the times. Last year, we had some mock-ups of accident-tolerant fuels, and this year it looks like columns of molten salt. So, <laughs> um, Each year, the RIC attracts a very broad audience from all over the world, and this year is no exception. We have around 2,500 registered participants from 38 countries. And to all of you who traveled great distances to be here with us today, thank you for making the trip, and we really hope you have a great conference. We also have some distinguished guests in the audience that I'd like to recognize. We have three former NRC chairmen, Richard Meserve, Nils Diaz, and Allison McFarlane. We also have four former NRC commissioners, Jeffrey Merrifield, George Apostolakis, William Magwood, and William Ossendorf. Thank you all for your service on the commission. We really appreciate your continued interest in the NRC, and it's always good to have you back. As you know, the is the NRC's largest public annual conference, and to pull off an event like this, it really takes a dedicated team of hardworking NRC staff, lots of volunteers from all the NRC offices and contractors. I do want to give a special shout out to Lorna Kipfer. Hi, Lorna, I said I was going to do this. Lorna has been the life force of the RIC for the last decade. So please join me in a hearty round of applause for Lorna and the dedicated staff that brought you this conference. I have three very quick housekeeping reminders. Uh, first, uh, please keep your name badge visible and on you at all times for your safety and security. Uh, second, if you see something, say something, report any suspicious or unusual activity to a security officer or a hotel volunteer, uh, staff member. And we do anticipate that several of our technical sessions will be at full capacity. If that's the case, please follow the instructions of the NRC volunteers and they'll uh, t tell you what to do. So, as you know, the NRC um, has embarked on a journey in, of change and transformation. And with that in mind, we have taken steps to transform the RIC itself. We've brought to you a, a really wide-ranging program of technical sessions, and you can find out about all those technical sessions in the new RIC mobile app. And you can find out more with the mobile app. We're, we're really, really excited about it. So I'd like to tell you about what's new at the RIC. W with the technical sessions, we've also included sessions this year on the nuclear fuel cycle. That's a new addition. And one of the things we're really excited about that I just mentioned is the new RIC mobile app. I, I think we think it's, it, it's just fantastic, and, and, and I want to tell you a lot more about it. And I know you're probably thinking that, hey, it's, it's just an app. We live in a world where there seems to be an app born every minute. But trust me, for the NRC to finally have a mobile app, it, it's a pretty big deal, and it's a big accomplishment <laughs> for us. So uh, join us in basking in our, our glory. Uh, <laughs> you know, using the app, you can quickly access the conference program, full speaker biographies, all the session presentation materials, the poster displays, participant contact information, as well as some networking features you might find interesting. And, and what's really cool about the app, we added a live polling feature to help us interact more with the audience, and we're going to be using live polls during the conversation with the NRC chairman and the executive director for operations. We'll also be doing some live polling of the audience during the advanced reactor session later today, session T4 and the reactor oversight process session tomorrow morning, session W15. And if you know the NRC, we never really do anything new unless without a pilot test. So I hope you've downloaded the app because I'd like you to pull out your mobile phones right now and I want you to tell us how we feel this morning. We're gonna put a test poll question up. So you go to the app and basically hit the live polling button and select the opening session test poll and tell us how you feel. I really hope this works. I'm a little nervous, but we'll, we'll see. So let, let's move on. Let's talk about what else is new at the RIC. So th this year, we were delighted to have a special guest speaker on the agenda. We have Nathan Mirvold who will join us later this morning. Nathan is the 
uh, founder and chief executive officer of Intellectual Ventures. He's also the vice chairman of TerraPower and formerly the chief technology officer at Microsoft. And we're really looking forward to his remarks on innovation, transformation, and regulating new nuclear technologies. And we hope that his remarks will help inspire us and also help us to stretch our imaginations. Also new to make things even more interesting and more engaging, several NRC commissioners will be chairing technical sessions during the week. And you can find out which programs those are uh, in, in the mobile app as well. I really like the mobile app. It's very functional. Um, we, we hope some of these new things that we've brought to the RIC really enhance the value of your experience at this conference. We know you've traveled a long way to spend your valuable time with us, and we want your feedback. Tell us what you think about these things. And we always try to make the RIC, each year's RIC, better than the year before. So you guessed it, use the app to give us the feedback. And if there's one thing I hope you take away from this year's RIC, it's that many things at NRC are no longer business as usual. So. Okay, now we're going to get to the point. Oh, before I do that, I, can we put the live poll results up and see how people are feeling? Okay. Great. Wow, that just happened. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm glad people are ready for spring, too, and I'm really glad that most of the people that polled are full of energy, and I, and I hope that represents the, the audience here. And, and, and believe me, I, I'm really glad I didn't put more of you to sleep, because I, I do want to stop talking. So in, in some ways, I feel a little confused, too, because in some ways, I think we all just did the largest group time travel experience. It's like the NRC finally made it to the 21st century. <laughs> okay. so. Now let's get to the point of the program where we're going to answer the question that's probably been in your back of your mind since I, we start, uh, since the beginning of the program. Why is there a living room set here on the center stage of the RIC? Okay. So new and different this year, the NRC chairman and the EDO will be sharing their perspectives and views in a more, more conversational and fluid manner while they talk about three important issues facing the agency. The first issue is the changing workload, those things that we need to be working on. The second topic is the changing workforce, those great people at the NRC that are helping us get the mission done. And, and the third topic is the need for efficiency and innovation in, in how we get our work done. And during each of the discussion topics, those three topics, there will be a live poll question. We want you to use your apps again, just like you did a moment ago and look for the questions on the two the large screens to the left and right of the stage and, and tell us how you feel. We're going to bring those live poll results into the, uh, to complement the com com conversation as well as the questions and answers. So we're going to get the conversation started. I'll be facilitating the discussion topics. Ray first and Al will join us after that with the question and answer. So make sure you fill out the, your question and answer cards and hand them to an NRC volunteer. We're, we're still old school with the cards, but, but that's okay. We can make that work well. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to welcome the NRC Chairman Christine Savinicki to the stage. She's no stranger to the RIC. This is her 10th appearance at this conference. Many of you know uh, Chairman Christ uh, the Honorable Christine Savinicki. She's been the Chairman since January of 2017. She's been on the Commission since 2008 and currently serving her third term. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning. I've noted your perfect attendance at this conference, and that is a noteworthy achievement for 10 years. Thank you, Thank you. Chairman Savinicki. Next, I'd like to welcome our EDO, Margie Doan, to the stage. Margie has been the EDO. Good morning, Margie. Good morning, Margie's been the EDO since <laughs> July of 2018. And, and this is her first Rick at, in her new capacity, but she's no stranger to NRC. She was formerly the general counsel from 2012 to 2018, and prior to that, the director of Office of International Programs. And now that you're my boss, I can't do any more lawyer jokes, but that's okay. Right. So, okay. Well, Round of applause. Engineer jokes. Okay, there's more of them. <laughs> okay. Morning, Good morning. Okay, so this is new and different. It is new and different. Good morning, everyone. I just want to add my welcome to host, more complete welcome that he just gave everybody. And uh, I, it's just a tremendous turnout, and the RIC is always such an enriching week to spend with colleagues and friends that we've worked with for so many years. So again, welcome, and thank you all for coming. Yes, and I'd also like to extend my welcome to all of you and, and to our international colleagues who traveled so far. and to also extend my gratitude to this, the NRC staff that, that helped us uh, put this together. It really is 
Um, it really is ambitious for us. I know that you've seen sort of armchair discussions in, in lots of di different fora, but this is very new for us. So it, we're excited it, it about it. It is new, but it's a nuclear's version of spontaneous, which is that we had all kinds of, we practiced how to walk on the stage yesterday yeah. and do that yeah, introduction. Well, so. Right, so you're going to give away all our <laughs> secrets. So I, I just want to, I, I did want to welcome one person, um, especially my husband's here. He came because it might be the only time he sees me this week um, since it's so. <laughs> busy, but no, I did want to extend a thank you to him. It's his first Rick as well. Okay. Well, thank you. So we're going to get the conversation started here, and I want to go to the first topic on the, on the changing workload, but I'm going to set the stage. Um, on one hand, we have the emergence of new technologies like accident-tolerant fuels, advanced manufacturing methods, advanced non-light water reactors, and on the other hand, we have an operating reactor fleet that is has growing interest in subsequent license renewals, but at the same time, it's getting smaller due to premature shutdowns. That's also leading to new business models and decommissioning. So this, this changing regulatory landscape, I think, demands that the NRC needs to be strategic and flexible in, in adapting to the challenges. So I'd, I'd like to go with the chairman first on this. Chairman, you, you've been on the commission for, for now over 10 years, and, and from your policy vantage point, can you tell us what's different and how that affects the agency going forward? Well, we did rehearse walking on the stage, but I do want to clarify that this is unscripted here, so we're going to, uh, we do know the topics. But as I reflect on that question, Ho, what an amazing opportunity the window of the last 10 years has been for me, because I, I, it may be one of the brightest contrast points if you took a 10-year slice of NRC history. When I joined this commission in 2008, there were points where we were receiving not just one COL application a month, but sometimes two. If we contrast that with today, we have uh, reactors that are ceasing operation early. We have a focus on decommissioning. So if the world can change that much in 10 years, it can change again in another 10 years. And what it's taught me is to have a, a real, a really deep humility about the ability to predict what that future is going to look like. And I, I think that's the strength of what NRC is focusing on right now. What we're, we're looking at, I know resiliency is talked about a lot, agility is another term that's used, but it is how can we structure and resource and organize our people and our work processes in a way that would allow us to be at least in the middle of the curve of adapting to whatever the, the future circumstances in the industry we regulate throws our way. And so I think that we're, we're looking at the, the things that have served us so well in the past, and NRC is and always has been a very high-performing organization, but I think the, the truth is that we realize that the things that have served us so well in the past are not necessarily the ways in which we should achieve this important mission going forward, and I think we've widened the aperture on that, and uh, that's the really exciting thing that we're involved in right now at NRC. I think it's a, a tremendous creative opportunity for all the current employees, and we're also soliciting for a lot of external feedback and ideas. If I may just follow up with that, you said that things that have served this past well may not be what we need to be doing today, is what I sort of heard. Can you give us a sense of kind of what type of things we need to be thinking about with this changing workload today? Well, that's to different me, than before. Transformation allows us to look at the work we have now and kind of an over, over the horizon projection of the kind of work, uh, both the amount and the, the subject area of work that we anticipate getting in the future. And it isn't so much that the what is changing. I think that we need to step back to first principles and look at the how of how we accomplish a lot of the things we do, because I think it's not an abandoning of a lot of what makes us strong. It's an opportunity to say, I'm not the person I was 10 years ago. I'm not the organization I was. I have an opportunity to look at what serves now, what works best. Okay, and we'll get to the hows, I think, in the third topic. So Margie, from general counsel to the EDO, wow. That's a, that's, a pretty big, that's a pretty big change, I would say. Uh, so you have a really unique set of experiences and, and uh, perspectives to lead the NRC in this really dynamic environment. Can, can you tell us about what you consider the NRC's operational strategies to adapt in this dynamically changing environment? Yeah, so I'll put a little bit of a finer point on what it's looked like this year. We've completed some very important milestones. 
and we have uh, we issued our 94th license renewal, which was an extension of, of a licensing term for a plant, a nuclear power plant. We have we're finishing up our mitigating strategy rule after Fukushima, and in materials we uh, signed the agreement with Wyoming, transferring much of, of the or much of the uranium recovery work to Wyoming. So this is completing a lot of very important multi-year effort work. But what we're seeing is a lot on the horizon. So we have plenty of work to do because we have that a large, the largest in the world nuclear fleet. And we also have new things on the horizon that you were mentioning, Ho, like uh, uh, new technology, advanced technology, fuels, all kinds of different things. So what I would say about the, work for, the workload is that it is steady. And we need strategies in place that are going to help us meet those challenges. And one thing that we did is we did a futures assessment this year. And what that is, is it's a, it helps us stretch our thinking. It's a, it's a scenario-based uh, look at what nuclear might look like in the future. It's not a prediction. It really is four separate scenarios. And we're going to use that to make sure that we can adapt to our environment. We're going to do things that, no matter what scenario we see ourselves in, we're going to kind of inoculate ourselves so that we will be effective. Um, and, and we'll talk about that more later in the session, some of the strategies we're going to use in that regard. But we're, we need to work smarter. And so some of the things that we're doing to work smarter is we are we have centers, for, uh, centers of expertise. We call them COEs. We have an acronym for everything. So you're going to hear a lot of acronyms today. Sorry, Chairman McFarland. She tried to get us away from that. <laughs> Our former Chairman McFarland. Um, so so uh, we have put some strategies in place like centers of expertise, COEs, and what that's doing is it's helping us bring all our experts to one place. And by doing that, we can share our thoughts much more quickly. We can move along and, and take and implement lessons learned uh, more efficiently. It also helps us save resources because we're not running around the whole agency finding all the experts. So centers of expertise. We're merging the offices of NRR and NRO, and that will bring us efficiencies and also bring together the technical knowledge of the new reactor office and um, uh, HOSE office, NRR. And then finally, we're using technology to help us use business insights to better track, plan, and organize our work. We're going to be looking at our data, mining our data for, for ways that we can better think about how we can approach problems learning from other organizations. So, and, and I think that, um, so if we look at all of these issues, I think what might be most important for us is the way we will marry technology. Not necessarily new because, but it would be new for us, like the mobile app. But it's, it's important that we harness that so we can look at the data that we already have. So those are some of the ideas. So. All right, th thanks Margie. You know, I'm looking at the results of the live poll here. It's hard to see, but what I saw was something similar to what the chairman said. We asked the audience what the biggest challenges are, and, and it looked like the audience selected those that polled that the, it's more of the how we do our work, the better use of risk information rather than sort of the what's, if you will. At least that's what the polls show. Would, would either of you like to comment on the poll results? Well, I would note uh, as a preview that Commissioner Caputo will be chairing a technical session on what is risk-informed decision-making. So it looks like uh, I think there's a lot of pre-registrants for that, and now we know why based on that live poll result, that's clearly a focus area that I think uh, the feedback we're getting is, and, and it is interesting, that is a rich and complex uh, topic, so I, I, I think getting to the how of that will be an important part of, of that dialogue in the technical session, and just, I think, a lot of sidebar conversations here this week at the RIC. Okay, well, th thank you for that, and I, I, if I may add, just from a perspective of having returned to the agency and just having been back for the last six months, I, I think the question I encounter very often is what does it mean to be risk informed? So I, I think the sessions we have here at the RIC will really maybe help us have a more unified understanding of the concept. Okay, so let's switch to the second topic now, which is the changing workforce. So in getting ready for the RIC, and I wrote some things down, there's not the answer cards, it's just to help me moderate this discussion here. I wrote down some statistics from the, our office of the Chief Human Capital Office, and in February of this year, we have roughly 2,900 staff members on board at the NRC. And that's significantly less than the roughly 4,000 we had in 2010, 4,018 to be exact. Look at the retirement statistics. We have 24% of our staff eligible to retire now, 38% eligible in three years, and 42% eligible in four years. 
And I looked at the demographics of the workforce. We have 23% that are under th 39 years old and only 2% that are under 30 years old. By the way, 30 years old, I read this morning, today's the 30th anniversary of the internet, be the World Wide Web, for those of you who read the news. So, okay. Anyway, I digress, sorry. So, <laughs> those people weren't born. So, so those statistics, let me, I want to start with Margie uh, for this, at first, if I may, Chairman. Uh, Margie, those statistics really must have your attention, I would think. And can you tell us what, what it means to you and what the NRC should be doing to prepare itself to build a sustainable workforce for continued success? Yeah, so those statistics certainly do have my attention. And, um, you know, I want to say that it's going to sound cliche, but our workforce is our greatest asset. It really is true. They're committed to our, our mission of public health and safety, common defense and security, and protection of the environment, and they're getting the work done for today. But we really need to put in place strategies, and we have strategies, and we are continuing to work on this to make sure that we can retain and recruit uh, new hires and that we can also uh, build the skills of our current workforce and, and to have the workforce of the future. So I can tell you a couple things that we're looking at, a couple strategies that we're using. For retention, we have something that's very ambitious. It's a strategic workforce planning process that is, is very ambitious. It's a multi-step process where we start out with an environmental scan. And again, we're going to use that futures assessment to make sure that we're thinking really broadly. But we do an environmental scan and then once we figure out exactly what we're going to, not exactly, but we figure out what we think will be necessary in the future, then it's a multi-step process where you finally end up figuring out where you, your skills are going to be adequate for the future, but then also where there are gaps. And then to address those gaps, we have some other strategies that we're using. We're using competency models to make sure we can really assess the skills and develop and train and look at our training programs and our qualification programs to make sure that they're going to work for the future for us. And then finally, we have uh, something where we call it uh, skills transformation. And for that, uh, we are looking at experiences that we can give our staff so that, as, like I was talking about, as work ceases, we can move them to work or complete. So when we complete work, we can move them to new work and make sure that they have the skills that's that are necessary for them to be effective. And, we really think this is going to be good for our workforce because they can better plan their future too. So, so this is something that we think is going to be a great retention tool. These strategies are good for retention. The new hires, that is a, the entry level. What, what I would discuss as that 2% hoe that really does have my attention. It's far below the federal government statistics for under 29. So 2% is, is quite low. So we are working on a strategy to um, have entry level hiring. Uh, very soon, so if you're out in the audience and you're a student, look for us, or if you have children, or you know, make sure you're looking out for the NRC, because this is a great place to work, and we're going to continue to make it a great place to work. And then finally, our leadership is, is the chairman has really spearheaded this effort where we, we are making sure that we are externally aware and that, and that we're being strategic in our thinking. So I think. Okay, thank you, Margie. Chairman, I, I've seen you nodding in, in agreement with some of what Margie's saying. Can you tell us what's going through your mind on this topic? Well, I think um, I would describe it very similar to what Margie's discussed. I'm kind of reacting a little bit to the poll results as well. It, it is, as I predicted, a fairly even spread. I note that technical competence is edging out the other categories, but I think um, all of the areas, I would interpret the poll result to mean all of these areas are going to be uh, important to us. Um, leadership and entry level, those kind of bookend the two categories of someone's career. But I think we're beginning with where we are and the people we have. We have a tremendous resource in the human capital of the agency, and Margie has talked about the mechanics of strategic workforce planning, and that's really what that's all about, is beginning with looking at where we have capacity, where we might have gaps either now or in the future, and that's it done in comparison to a workload. And then we're also looking at opportunities uh, to kind of, they use the term reskilling. I don't I, I, that's very fashionable right now, but I, I look at it as investment in our current workforce, in new opportunities, developmental opportunities, not just so that they can do their job today, but how might we make them a double threat or a triple threat or give them new capacity so that we can move people to work as it emerges in a more agile way. You know, it, 
I was here for the period when we went from 4,000 to the under 3,000 that we have today. And when our work shifted a, a bit away from a heavy emphasis on new reactor work, was moving more to some of our post-Fukushima work, we found that we had extremely cumbersome internal processes for moving people and just basically reassigning them from something that was coded as a new reactor activity to something that was coded as an operating reactor activity. Those are obstacles that organizations put in their own way. And part of transformation is the basics of looking for where we're not even serving our own processes well and how could we do better. Okay. I, I do want to draw something out from the poll result that kind of caught my attention. It was the subject of external awareness. And yesterday, I was in a meeting with one of our deputy executive directors, Dan Dorman. He was talking about the external awareness factor in the futures assessment that we hadn't really been looking at the effect of natural gas prices on the industry we regulate. So I've certainly sensed a, a focus on external awareness, particularly with the leadership at NRC coming from the top levels of the organization. So I'd like to ask either of you if you'd care to uh, share your views on what, what external awareness means to you when we talk about that. Well, I would note that um, it got 16% in, in the poll result, external awareness did. I, it makes me intrigued, like many of us are very data-driven. I wonder what the split would be if it were only NRC employees who were responding on this. They might resonate more with the focus on external awareness. The way I view external awareness is that the agency has at times had a very singular focus on technical competence, and while that is obviously very important to the work we do, as we move people to broader and broader responsibilities, often that is a necessary but not sufficient component in grooming future project managers and leaders of the agency. So. We have had a focus on that. I might toss this back at you, Ho, and say, you have gone, stepped away from NRC and come back not once, but twice, once to the International Atomic Energy Agency and once to the Nuclear Energy Agency under the OECD. When you step away and come back, what, what have you seen in, in terms of the workforce and their focus? Okay, well, I, I hadn't necessarily been anticipating getting questions, but uh, I, I can... <laughs> I suppose I should re react to that. I, I think what I've seen uh, coming back, Chairman, in, in terms of the work focus and, and the workforce, I, I really think there were things that really remained very steadfast was the, the workforce's commitment to the uh, work of the agency and, and wanting to do our work very, very well and wanting to really have high technical quality in the, in the products we deliver in the licensing and oversight programs. Uh, what I've also seen, which is actually very encouraging, I know you've heard that the, you know, the NRC, we've embarked on this journey of change and transformation, and I really think that there are many staff that I've encountered in, in headquarters in the region that really are, are embracing the spirit, that are really looking at ways to do their jobs better. They recognize that the, the state of the fleet is not what it was today as it was, let's say, 20 years ago. So I, I've, I've seen a, a recognition of that, and I think people are, are, are being more externally aware. And I would, have, I would apologize for tossing a question to you, but you know, you know full well you can take the woman out of the chairman's office, but you can't take the chairman's office out of the woman, <laughs> right, Allison? Right. <laughs> so, so Ho, maybe, maybe I'll add Please. to this on external awareness. I, I think really for us, it's, it's taking the best ideas and the brightest ideas, thinking big and creative, and and harnessing what we see out in, in other organizations, other government agencies. There's so much for us to learn, and we're very open. We, we do have a learning environment. And so for external awareness for us, that's, that's what we're doing. We're benchmarking, we're looking at these other, uh, like I said, even international organizations, we're so appreciative of the willingness of our international partners to share their experiences with us. So when we say external, we mean the whole globe. Um, and I think with our next speaker, we're, we're going to see that. Really this well, and, and I, I would just add to that by saying um, it's our vision, and I'm 100% confident that NRC can give anybody a run for their money. I, when I think about the talent and ingenuity that we have, I know that we could be the federal agency bringing examples that are showcased across the government. And I'm really excited about, I think we're on the threshold of that kind of energy and excitement emerging on transformation. And I, I don't set any standard less than best in class for us. I, I, know we've, I know we've got it, we've got what it takes, 
and we could absolutely crush this thing. So, uh, but you know, it's like any change, it comes down to a choice. And, and NRC, I've been here long enough, so I have the blessing of being able to, to say this from my long observation. But NRC is capable of anything it puts its mind to, but what will it choose? That's the question. And I think as leaders, you can lead but the organization as a whole is going to have to embrace and invest itself in transformation, and we'll see. Okay, well, thank you. And I, I would say from the poll, I was very encouraged to see technical competence as an area that people thought were important. I would just share this weekend, I know Kathy Haney, the Region 2 Regional Administrator, and I were on a very uh, early morning phone call at 1 a.m. Saturday morning dealing with an issue at a plant, an unusual event, and I could say when we were listening to what was happening at the facility, it really underscored the importance of our technical competence and our sharp skills out in the region to really understand what's happening at the facility so we can make the right response decision. So I, I, I really appreciate the audience feedback on the technical competence. So we'll move to the third topic now. This is uh, efficiency and innovation and in how we do our work. You know, we are on this journey of change. We want to be a more risk-informed regulator to enable new technologies, and we want to embrace innovation and creativity in how we do our work. And I think it's a really exciting time to be working at the agency right now. And, and along with this effort and, and trying to shift our mindset to embrace things like innovation and creativity, I would say this setup you see today right now was actually done in part, in large part, by the bright young people that formed the agency Innovation Forum. So they helped us uh, conceive this idea. So I, I really think that that's a really wonderful sign that, that we're trying to be more innovative and creative. So, Chairman, for, for the last two years at the RIC, I, I've heard you say and, and talk about you know, whether the NRC can change to be more risk-informed. And last year, you talked about the pace of change happening at the NRC, and you mentioned that we were standing at the threshold of a step change with the transformation effort. So were you prophetic last year? Where, where are we today? Prophetic. That's a big word, isn't it? There'd be a lot of hubris in claiming to live in uniquely changing times. And so, uh, you know, but having said that, I'm going I'm to stand by my observation of last year, which is that I think if you look at a lot of even technology development, there is a kind of a plodding along, there's a really deliberative pace, there's kind of some failures and frustrations, there's things that are tried, hypotheses that are tested that don't prove out, but then all of a sudden you can break beyond that and have a bit of a breakthrough. And I think that NRC stands at the threshold of doing something like that, again, all of these processes will involve, you know, hundreds and thousands of people at NRC that decide to take the transformation journey. And so the outcome is not assured, but I know that the capability is there. And, you know, transformation is a really big word. If you were to think about it in your personal life or your family life or your professional life, and the truth of transformation for me is that it happens basically one outcome, one conversation, one action, and one decision at a time. And I think that is NRC's approach, which makes the whole thing conquerable, even though it is such a, such a tall objective. Okay. Margie, so I've heard you say that our products are our decisions. So could you please tell us what you see as the main focus areas for improving our innovation and efficiency to getting at our decisions? Yeah, so I'm going to try to see if I can work in this analogy, because it helps me think about these issues. So probably by now, everybody's familiar with Marie Kondo and her, her way of coming into a house and decluttering it, and, and the family is then surrounded by only things that spark joy. So it, it is just, it, it's a miraculous sort of change that happens. She comes in and she tells you to look at what's what's really good and sparks joy, and then others, you appreciate it, you respect what you had, but you let it go because you know time's moving on. And I really see our transformation as analogous to this because what we're trying to do is we, one thing that you don't want to do, we've learned from other organizations, is you don't want to change what's really good about your organization and what's really good about us and, and why first focus area is our commitment to the mission. I, I did mention that before, but it's absolutely imperative that as we change, for the American people, we remain committed to our mission. So that's really the first area when I'm thinking about decision-making that, that we focused on. The second thing that we're focusing on 
is we're looking far and wide for good ideas. And uh, this is what I was talking about, about thinking big. And it might come from the newest person at the agency, or it might come from the most seasoned person at the agency, or it might come, it might be external thinking, but we're, we're thinking big. We're trying to get uh, a lot of uh, new ideas into our decision making and then be very inclusive in how we resolve those issues. And then we are trying to take risk and sites, and I see that what's come up on the screen is uh, reducing the zero risk mentality. And you know, I, I thought about it, when I saw it, I thought that's, that's what's gonna be picked. And, and I understand what this is. This is, this is really a signal, and, and I, I agree with this, uh, that if you have a zero risk mentality, you can't easily shift or change because you're so concerned about the risk, that you're weighed down with it. And in this way, this is my decluttering idea, you know, in my mind. We have to take away the processes and the things that are, were built really around the mid, around mid 20th century technology. We've put a lot of processes in place and, and this is making it very difficult for us to twist and turn. So it's those things that we need to really look at trying to um, address so that we can move forward in a more adaptive, flexible way, like the chairman was talking about it, with more agility. So, um, and then finally, once we make these better decisions, we need to be able to communicate them well, because we understand very well, and we have decades of working with the community and with external communities and also internal within our organization and other federal agencies, we understand that with change, comes some uncomfortableness. So to, to, to take care of that, we need to build trust, and we'll do that by communicating our message well. And I, I just want to say I'm excited to be on this journey, and I know that we can change um, in, in a way that will make us even, even a better place to work than we are now. And um, I think we're going to do it one decision at a time. I thought we'd have at least one or two contrarians in the room that would vote for nothing, everything is just fine. That zero kind of astonishes me because I know people have really strongly held views in the nuclear <laughs> enterprise, so that surprises me a little bit. But I guess, you know, it reminds me a little bit, so since I've been on our commission for 10 years, I've testified before a lot of congressional committees and Senator Carper uh, on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee who uh, has had a consistent interest in the agency's success and well-being, which I appreciate very much. He has a saying, and it says, if it's not perfect, you can make it better. So I'll, I'll interpret that 0% uh, for everything is just fine, is that no one's perfect, so we can obviously make some things better. But beyond that, again, I, I see a strong emphasis on the result on a lot of different areas. So it tells me we're not going to have the luxury of a singular focus in transformation. It's going to be like Margie said. We're going to have to really cast a wide net. But I think in that, there's a great opportunity. Every employee at NRC has some dimension of what they do that they might want to make a suggestion could be done better and differently. So everyone is welcome in, in this endeavor, and I think that that can be kind of exciting for us. Okay. I, I want to react a little to the poll result also on the reducing the zero risk mentality. It was interesting to see that that's what the poll responders chose uh, most for us to focus on, and I would say that I've seen in the last six months a few examples that are interesting to me, and I'd like to get your thoughts. Um, one example in, in having these all-hands discussions and meeting with the staff, uh, I've heard the question, well, what if I'm wrong? You know, and then I had another example recently. I was in Region 4 uh, meeting with Scott Morris's staff. Uh, one of his inspectors stood up and gave a real good example of how he saw something at a power plant. He brought in some risk information, looking how long the component was actually being used and, and applied some risk and judgment to, to get on the right path to, to disposition it in, in, with the right level of resources in, in the inspection program. So, what would, what would you say to the staff members in terms of the zero risk mentality? You know, our mission is reasonable assurance of adequate protection. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to share with the audience, particularly those people at the NRC, in, in terms of what uh, moving away from the zero men risk mentality means to you? Well, I'll start. I, I used the term humility earlier, and one of the things uh, that I found that keeps me grounded is reading 
uh, the votes of a lot of the former members of our commission, and some of that we have some uh, old records back to the early days of the agency, but I think that there's humility in reflecting on the uncertainties that your predecessors faced, and again, it gets to this notion of thinking that you've got it so uniquely complex and challenging. Well, people throughout time and people throughout the brief history of nuclear, which is not like other types of sciences, have really struggled with a lot less access to data and tools that we have today. So I kind of pivot the question and say, with the amount of kind of analytical and computational tools that we can have today, with the thousands of years of reactor operating experience that we have today, which our predecessors decades ago did not have, can't we actually root our safety and security decisions in a greater confidence than our predecessors? And have we become so consumed with the, the amount of decimal places that we can, we can derive now that we've decided that that somehow correlates to overall assurance and certainty? And I, I think we can lose sight of the fundamentals that we are human beings making human decisions in a very ca cautious and careful and thorough way. But it doesn't mean that we just fail to address and get our arms around an acceptable level of uncertainty. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Okay, well, let's have a round of applause for Chairman Sfinnicky and our EDO, Margie Doan. <laughs> and now we're gonna get to the question and answer part of this uh, conversation here, and I'd like to welcome Ray Furson, now the Director of the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research to the stage, and Ray's gonna facilitate the Q&A with the Chairman and EDO. Well, thanks. We got a lot of good questions. As far as the polling goes, we got about 500 people responding to, wow. to the polls. That's, that's a pretty good percentage. So thanks for everybody for, for doing that. Uh, we had a lot of questions on, on innovation. And uh, I'll kind of combine a couple, too, because so, some of them were very similar. Um, with the new direction of the agency uh, and on, with ROP transformation, et cetera, capitalizing on risk-informed decisions. What's the NRC doing to ensure uh, leadership courage to change the culture of the NRC staff in order to meet these challenges? And Chairman, would you like to start with that? Well, I think that Margie and I touched on that a little bit, and you noticed that leadership was one of the focus areas in the live polling questions. Uh, for Margie and I, I know we're, we're focused on leadership development and looking at how we've prepared leaders in the past and what are the attributes that will best contribute to the success of future leaders and the success of the agency as a whole. So we have made some changes, uh, speaking of Margie's point about acronyms, we have the SES CDP, it's the Senior <laughs> Executive Service Candidate Development Program, and it's really the beginning of the feeder pipeline for future leaders, not only in NRC, but the concept is they could flow throughout the government to other executive uh, capacities in federal agencies. But we began under Victor McCree, uh, Margie's predecessor, to make some changes to the overall selection criteria and the weighting of factors and attributes. And so we are trying to begin with a candidate pool that is more diverse in thought, in race, in gender, uh, in all these aspects, and in, uh, but also educational backgrounds with the continued emphasis on technical competence, but looking at the fact that you need executives that have things beyond technical competence, and have we developed and has our pipeline been adequate from that standpoint? So I think, I think we have a lot of focus on it, and we are a nuclear agency, so after we've made these changes to the candidate pool, for this class, and then we will be assessing later on whether or not we achieved what we set out to, to achieve with those changes. Thanks. I guess to maybe add to the question a little bit for you, Margie, is, is along with that, what, what, are, what are the things are you doing since you've come on board as EDO to get uh, full support of the staff and the, and the changes that are being made? So I think I'll give a plug for something that we put in place, and it was actually started while I wasn't an executive, a senior executive as the general counsel, but now we are implementing it. It's something we have coined the leadership model, and Rob Lewis should deserve a lot of credit because he's put a lot of thinking into this, if uh, any of you know him. Um, and the leadership model is really a set of behaviors that it, it's common sense, it's, it's things that we would all think about would be necessary to, when you're changing an agency, but we put a lot of thought into it because it's helping us think about being more inclusive and taking risk insights into consideration. And so this leadership model recognizes that 
everybody at the NRC is a leader. We all are going to do our part. We all have a role in this transformation. And, and so that's one of the things that we're doing. And, and we're really carrying that through and trying to hold each other accountable for, for, these, uh, for the uh, ideals that are in this model. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the senior leadership team came together, and most recently, and we talked about the, our, our first line supervisors, the ones that are really you know, there on a day-to-day -day basis working with our staff, and how important it is to, to be supporting them in their uh, journey to, to, to transform and making sure that we are there for them because transformation is hard and, and, and they've requested that of us to make sure that we're there for them when they're making hard decisions, that we don't change those as they go up the line, that we have the courage to, to make those decisions as well and that also as we bring these brighter ideas in and have new ways of thinking that, that we think about how we were, the processes that we were using before and be open to even using new processes. So those are some of the things that we're doing, Ray. Okay, um, you mentioned about transformation, Margie, and, and, and Chairman as well. What's the, what is the NRC transforming into? Gonna go first, or you want me? So, you know, I think of it like this, this Marie Kondo okay, theory, right? Okay, yeah, we're back. So we I, have to and here's a why. mixing bowl and, and parking and, door. <laughs> no, so, so here's why, here's why. So I see us really changing in that we will look at what is very important to us, and, and we will hold on to that, but we will streamline our processes, we'll be able to move in a more adaptive and flexible way because we are going to look for new things that we can bring in, new ideas, and in the end, where we, we will change so many different parts of our organization in a way that really helps us achieve our mission in a different way. We like to think about innovation muscles, like we talk about that, innovation muscles, trying to build that muscle so that it won't be something that we think about as this big, large thing that we have to achieve. It'll be part of our everyday existence. We'll, we'll be thinking about changes as we go along. We'll be able to readily see things and use new technology and, and have someone to bring that to and get those solutions quickly. So that's what we will transform into. I think we already have gone a long way toward that. We have done things like the reactor oversight process, was, which was a significant innovation at the time, but now that's 20 years old and we don't want to do just one innovation here or one innovation there. We really want to look at the whole agency in our decision making and, and, and transform that. So transformation will be one decision at a time, that's why we say that. Chairman, do you want to take a stab at that question? I, I agree with the, the description that Margie has given and I think that one of the things is that it isn't going to be a strongly top-down process, which is consistent with the way that she's described it. I don't think that the commission has an appetite or desire to come up with every uh, dimension and idea and attribute of, of a transformed agency. Members of the, the commission turn over over time, and this needs to be something that, that the heart of the organization is really moving forward with. And if done well, I agree that it becomes part of the culture and it becomes it, it, the atmosphere and it isn't something that's a project off to the side like over the next hour of my day I'm going to have innovative thinking. It's just a way of thinking that is brought to everything that you do. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit. This is more of a specific question and this is not to take away, Chairman, from your technical session, but it might be related to that. Uh, do you think the nuclear profession is placing too much hope and emphasis on advanced reactors? Are advanced reactors really going to be a panacea or could it become an albatross? Oh goodness, well that is a good question to ask my extremely erudite panel that I will have this afternoon in the advanced reactor technical session, but you know, Ray, when you read the question and said, you know, are we placing too much hope, I guess it depends on what you're hoping for, so with an absence of a definition of that, I'm really not sure. I'm a, I, I don't like absolute statements. I guess I should have been a lawyer instead of an engineer, but um, I don't know that anything is, is a panacea. Um, so I'm really not sure how to answer that question. I, I think the energy policy of the U.S. has nuclear playing a role now and into the future, and so for NRC what we're focused on is having a kind of a regulatory framework that provides the absolutely necessary assurances of reasonable assurance of, of adequate protection, but also 
doesn't, is not so aligned to large light water reactor technology that certain advanced reactor technologies are such a, a, a bad fit with that that, they, that we're just an absolute obstacle on the, on the path. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe uh, Margie, related to that question, what, what's, uh, what do you see the staff as doing to be ready for the advanced reactor concepts that, that we see coming along in the future? So some of the things that the staff is doing, and you can speak better than me, Ray, so I might toss this back <laughs> at you if you're allowed to do that. Do so that. I'll, I'll touch on it, and then I am. I am going to send it back to you. But, but you know, one thing that the NRC is really, really good at is we put plans together. In fact, we put plans together so much that we have an acronym, IAP, that applies to several different plans, Integrated Action Plan, Implementation for Non-Water, Non-Light Water uh, Reactors. And so we have a lot of planning. So. We've put plans in place. They have milestones to make sure, like I've talked about um, throughout this session, they, we're looking at making sure we have the skills that are necessary, that we have the resources that are necessary, but also that we have the tools, the codes and things like that that will be necessary for uh, us to be successful with advanced reactors. And we'll have to use all the, the strategic workforce planning that I was talking about to make sure that we have the skills that are necessary. And um, I'm gonna toss this back to you, but one thing that, that we're, looking at to make sure that we're, we're thinking broadly is this futures assessment that, that has several, it has four scenarios, and, and we're really thinking about uh, how you get prepared for technology that you've never licensed before and, and will bring really new and challenging issues. It's a very exciting time, but it, it does take a lot of planning. So, Ray, what did I forget? I think that pretty well covered it. I, I know in working with, uh, from the research perspective, I remember this is my boss up here. So. But uh, from a research perspective and, and working with the new reactor office as well, I think we're, our, our goal is to be ready for whatever's coming down the line. What, you know, it's hard to predict exactly what, what technology might come yeah. first, but our, our really our goal is to be ready. And I think from the outside, it may be hard to understand why the things that, that we've talked about even this morning in this session, how they all come together. But as Ray's talking about, you know, different technologies for advanced reactor, Margie, Margie talked earlier about centers and centers of expertise. The agency is looking at that as one opportunity to kind of house experts or expertise together. And in the morning, they could, you know, someone from that center could be reviewing a safety aspect of a molten salt reactor design that's been submitted for certification. And in the afternoon, they could be supporting the operating reactor fleet in reviewing some safety dimension of a, of a license amendment request that's come in. And so when we talk about agility and putting people on the work as it comes in, that's why I talked about reinvesting and investing strongly in the workforce that we have to make sure that we give them that kind of fungibility across different technologies. Okay. Um, Margie, I think I'll uh, have this question to you. Uh, the NRC is open to new ideas. We stated that in the discussion. The, how are you monitoring or, uh, or assessing this at the, at the lower staff levels at the NRC? So I'll just, I'm not sure if it's talking about how my mind that the staff at all levels of the agency get to get their ideas up to uh, senior management. I'll just take it, I'll just take that and then maybe sort of talk about this. So um, some of the things that we're doing, we have something called Innovate NRC. So yeah, we have a lot of different ways of, of surfacing your ideas, but we have something called Innovate NRC which was a grassroots effort by my predecessor, um, Vic McCree, and it was at first only out in other offices and out in the region. And um, what it would do is it's kind of a collection box of good ideas. And so if you had a good idea, a good uh, a way that we could maybe streamline our work or, or um, maybe some things that we shouldn't be doing anymore, all kinds of things, anything that you could think of that would help the agency move forward in, in this journey, you could put it into these collection boxes. And, and these were being handled at the different organizations. But then we figured out that you couldn't resolve all problems at the organizational level. And so we then did an innovate, an agency innovate NRC. And so that now is providing an opportunity for our, our staff to, staff all over the agency to put in ideas for innovation. And so that's, I would say, that's the way we're harnessing the ideas. And then what we have is we have a um, pairing of executives with the innovation team to make sure that we're getting back to those individuals who have suggested the ideas and that we're trying to bend them. And, and, and we have already 
taken some examples and already put them in place. Okay, thanks. Chairman, um, qu uh, next question is, how do you see the use of modern technology uh, extending the life of uh, current power plants in the context of decision making and zero risk mentality? Well, Margie's mentioned the uh, futures assessment a few times. and. Uh, one of the things that I found really interesting about it is it does have what we call four scenarios or four stories, as we've called them, of what the nuclear industry may look like in the United States over a longer period of time. But one of the strengths, I think, of the futures assessment that we've had done is that there are certain takeaways and things that NRC could think about doing that make sense no matter which of those uh, visions of the future ends up being true. And I think that's some of the resiliency that we need, and maybe that's the humility of a learning from 10 years ago when I joined the commission where there was such a rapid upsizing of our capacity and our staffing and everything else. What I appreciate and, and enjoy is the prudency of some of these new thoughts is that uh, they benefit you no matter what the future throws at you. And so I, I think that's an aspect of what the futures assessment has us thinking about is if you have um, a lot of remote sensing devices in nuclear power plants and they're feeding back surveillance data in a fundamentally different way than sending out a human operator or employee to go and check out the functioning of some plant component, of course the operator of the plant is going to use that new uh, remote technology in a different way. But then transformation for us is how can we take that on board on our side of the safety ledger? How can that be a benefit for, as I said early, earlier, being able to provide the American public an even greater assurance of the knowledge of safety at a plant. And so I think that as the technology uses new artificial intelligence, new data analytics, uh, we're looking at through our futures assessment as what might that mean for us, how might that show up on our side of the safety mission, and uh, that's part of what we're exploring for the future. Thanks. Got a question for you, Margie, on workforce. Um, with the statistics that were presented on, on aging workforce, et cetera, uh, what, what, uh, what's the NRC doing in decreasing budgets to, to look at new hires? Mm. So we are, so we're just beginning to take a different kind of look. So we've been reducing the size of the agency, and that's, that's really made sense because a lot of our work has gone away. We, like the chairman had said in her opening, you know, we had a COL coming in you know, once a year, sometimes twice a year, and so that has really changed. And so we've been reducing the size of the agency, and we've gone down about 25%. And so in that time period when we were reducing the size of the agency, we were very carefully doing this and monitoring our work, making sure we could get the work done for the day, um, we were not able to do new hiring like we had done for, for um, the last, uh, I'd say, uh, decade and a half with something that we called the, N well, I won't go through, it, it was a new hiring process. The NSPD, 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 yeah. right. And so, uh, um, so we had this process that we put in place and it was very effective, but we, we stopped um, utilizing that process as we were bringing the agency down. We did this through attrition. We've come down, like I said, almost a quarter of our size, which is really tremendous, probably the size of many of your organizations. And so we didn't do the new hiring. And then when we started thinking about this, we thought, well, we need to continue because all government agencies, my prediction would be, are going to be leaner just because of the aging federal workforce. They're going to be leaner, and we need to work smarter. And so. We need these new, the new thinking and uh, that, that new entry hires will bring in. And so what we're doing is we're looking at how to continue to bring the agency down appropriately, but also to bring that new, the new hires in and, and, so, and to reinvigorate that process that we already had that was very successful. So it's, it's not a whole wholesale turn, it's just a little turn around the corner because we've, we already had this process and, and like I said, you know, we're, I'm hoping that we, through this session, are, are sparking interest in the agency. Okay, thank, thank you, Ray, and thank you, Chairman uh, Margie. I, we're, we have just, I want to give you 40 seconds to see if you have any final thoughts here. We're going to conclude the session, but any, anything you'd like to add, Margie, just on the overall new and different thing we did here? 
Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, this has really energized all of you for the week and that we'll get really good input and discussions during our sessions and that we'll continue at the agency to think big and, and then I just want to re-emphasize this is a, it really is a great place to work. I'm so appreciative of all the efforts that the staff has given me um, to, to make me, help me to be successful uh, in this new leadership role and, and I'm looking forward to you know, being on this journey to change one decision at a time. Okay, thanks, Margin. Channel, the, the final, final word, any new book you read or show you're watching you want to talk about? We always love hearing well, about that. I, um, I have a painful <laughs> commute, which I've probably mentioned in the past, um, but I listened to a lot of podcasts as a result, and I thought of a lot of different things. I, I did know that you'd offer me an opportunity to just kind of have some final thoughts, but... Um, I listen uh, to Oprah Winfrey because she is an amazing interviewer and she interviews a lot of really interesting uh, kind of thought leaders and scholars and other people like that. But it was noteworthy to me when she said she, she named the toughest question she was ever asked. And she said it was, I don't know what the context was, but she had to actually go back to the moderator like the next day and catch him or her in the hallway and go, I've had time to think about it now and I have an actual answer to your question, but it's uh, intriguing as people, if they're thinking about right now, what, what would be the toughest question that, uh, sh that Oprah Winfrey who's interviewed thousands of people, what was the toughest question she was ever asked? And the question was, what do you know for sure? And it's an interesting thing to think about, particularly for me, uh, having a technical background and then uh, coming to the NRC and thinking about the fact that we have a lot of focus on uncertainty, and that's appropriate because we're trying to come to uh, levels of confidence that we need to come to on various decisions we have to make. But we know a lot for sure. And I think that it's good sometimes to pull back and think about Yes, this problem seems intractable. It has a lot of tentacles into other things and it can be really complicated. But to pull back and go, but what am I absolutely sure about when it comes to this? So I think for me, I'm sure that change is possible. I'm sure that NRC has a lot of dazzling ideas and concepts and I know that we can bring that forward. I don't know what we'll choose to do, and I don't know what form it will take. I don't think it'll be a top-down thing, and I, I think, as Margie said, if done well, it'll become part of a mindset of how we go about doing things. So maybe as each of you go about and have conversations at the RIC this week, uh, you'll challenge each other as you're talking about something that seems unsolvable. You'll say, but what do we know for sure about this? And at this point, given all of the work of the pioneers in nucle the nuclear enterprise, all of the people who have come before us, our regulatory counterparts from around the world that are here, a lot of things have been tried, a lot of things, a lot of, lots been learned over the course of decades in this very, very young technology in a historic sense. But we know a lot, we know, uh, we, are, we are blessed to know a lot more than our predecessors knew, and so I think that it's a great foundation for us to build on moving forward, for, for not just for regulatory, but for the nuclear enterprise as a whole. Okay, well, thank you for that final note. I, I know for sure that I'm no Oprah Winfrey, so <laughs> <laughs> big round of applause for uh, Chairman Sminicki and uh, Marjorie Dona Radio. Great job. And now we'll be transitioning to the next Commissioner Plenary. Thank you. continue with the plenary program. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker is uh, Commissioner Jeff Barron. The uh, Honorable Mr. Barron was sworn in as commissioner in October of 2014. He's currently serving a term ending in 2023. During his tenure, Commissioner Barron's priorities have included a strong focus on safety as, as the agency adapts to a changing workload, requiring and implementing effective safety enhancements in response to the Fukushima Daiichi accident, improving oversight of power reactors, entering decommissioning, and boosting the openness and transparency of agency decision making. Over the past four years, he has visited po operating power reactors, a nuclear plant undergoing active decommissioning, research and test reactors. We went on a tour of one together, Commissioner Byrne, and uh, a nuclear plant 
uh, fuel cycle facilities, a low-level waste facility, and a variety of other, other uh, facilities using radioactive materials. He's also been to Fukushima Daiichi for a first-hand look at conditions and activities on the site. As was mentioned in the introduction by uh, Honi, uh, the, the commissioners are, are hosting some technical sessions, and I'm going to make a pitch for a Commissioner Barron's session this afternoon, um, a technical session, T3 re regional session on uh, the current nuclear power plant regulatory issues. That's at 1.30 in Ballroom D, and you're running neck and neck with the chairman on who's having the most attendees, so maybe this will take care of that. So with that, uh, uh, Commissioner Barron, thank you. Thanks, Ray. Good morning. It's great to see everyone here. We'll try to further boost attendance for this afternoon. Um, after four Rick speeches, I have reluctantly come to the conclusion that there aren't very many cheesy nuclear jokes out there, and most of them are really quite bad. Uh, so I am dropping them from the speech. Uh, I'm done with them. Uh, frankly, I'm tired of the pained groans. They're demoralizing when you're up here. Uh, but I am not going to leave you uh, in a lurch. I'm going to meet your demands for comedic levity, which brings me to New Reg 0544, NRC's legendary collection of abbreviations. Now, I suspect that some of you might not believe that NRC actually published a 37-page tome of impenetrable acronyms. So I brought it along. Here it is, this on the screen. I'm not making this up, it's real. Oh, maybe you could load this into the mobile app. People can have this. This is actually revision five, it says right here, revision five, um, which means we actually went through the exercise of assembling every imaginable nuclear abbreviation six times. Uh, the latest version was lovingly put together by a working group of 20 NRC employees. To those 20 individuals, I don't know who you offended to get that assignment, but on behalf of the commission, please allow me to formally apologize. According to the abstract, the goal of this new reg is to improve communication with and within the NRC. Terrific goal. Not sure. 37 pages of abbreviations get you there, uh, but I digress. I actually got through the new reg, and I still don't really understand what new reg stands for. Uh, but this document is nothing short of riveting. It includes some great questions to ponder. One section is titled, Why Use Abbreviations? Good question. Another section asks, What is plain language? It was at that point I figured we were in real trouble. Uh, but if you, if you suspend your disbelief and, and temporarily accept the premise that the world can be made better through abbreviations, there's some great stuff in there. When you hear the word badger, you may think of a cute animal or the act of pestering someone or a student at the Univer University of Wisconsin, Commissioner Caputo's alma mater. But at NRC, badger means boron-10 aerial density gauge for evaluating racks. If someone says, that's classy, you may think that you are the recipient of a nice compliment. Do not be fooled or flattered. That NRC employee is trying to tell you about a continuum linear analysis of soil structure interaction. At NRC, CPR is not a life-saving procedure. It is the common prioritization of rulemaking. Watch out for that. If the mention of Epicure makes you think a gourmet lunch is coming your way, you will be sorely disappointed to learn that what may be in the offing is an experimental program for iodine chemistry under irradiation. That's four abbreviations. There are just over 1,000 to go. <laughs> so we have something to look forward to for next year, I guess. Now, in fairness, to the agency, the preface does say, in an ideal environment, the NRC would not require a reference book of abbreviations. I would like to think we can all agree on that. Uh, the new reg also advises us to avoid using abbreviations whenever possible. And in all seriousness, I think that's good advice. As an independent safety regulator serving the public, transparency, openness, and clear communication are critical to NRC success. When we share as much information as we can, describe the issues and the agency's work in understandable language, 
and are open to the feedback we receive, then interested stakeholders can meaningfully participate in regulatory discussions, and NRC makes better decisions. Since last year's RIC, a new conversation has started about transformation and innovation at NRC. Staff has begun to focus on how we as an agency make decisions and how we communicate with each other and external stakeholders. I heard a little bit about that earlier this morning. Regardless of whether we label it transformation, I think this particular effort makes a lot of sense. We need to identify the full range, range of views early so we can carefully consider them as we move through the decision-making process. Ultimately, we want the decision maker to have an open-minded and thorough analysis of the different options and viewpoints. There's no question in my mind that when we do this well, it improves the quality of the decisions we make. In my time this morning, I want to share my thoughts about how NRC should approach transformation and give you some concrete examples of potential changes I see as positive and changes I believe would take us in the wrong direction. In my view, it makes sense to consider transformational change when a new technology challenges NRC's existing regulatory approach, or when the agency has historically struggled to regulate effectively in a particular area. On the other hand, when a regulatory process has worked well over the years, it's better to pursue targeted refinements aimed at solving clearly defined problems. Whether NRC is considering a major transformational change or a more modest incremental change, we must keep our focus squarely on our safety and security mission. Transformation at NRC can't be about rolling back safety and security standards to save money. And it can't be about fewer inspections or weaker oversight. That would take NRC in the wrong direction. When considered with these criteria in mind, some of the transformational changes proposed by the staff or external stakeholders pass muster, and others do not. There are ideas we should explore as part of this effort, and other ideas we should reject as inconsistent with our mission as an independent safety regulator. A strong case for transformation can be made when it comes to updating NRC's regulations to account for non-light water reactor technologies. NRC's current power reactor regulations were written for light water reactors, which make up the entire existing fleet. So it makes sense to update those requirements to address different technologies. NRC is already doing a lot of work in this area. And I support developing a performance-based, technology-inclusive regulation for the licensing of non-light water reactors. As the agency proceeds with this effort, it will be important to balance the broad rulemaking activities with the need to focus sufficient resources on the design-specific work for particular applications. The staff also recommends developing a new digital instrumentation and control regulation based on high-level, performance-based safety design principles rather than on highly prescriptive standards. The new rule likely would move away from exclusive reliance on one set of consensus standards and establish a process by which applicants could meet alternative standards that have been successfully used in other industries and countries. NRC's regulatory approach to digital instrumentation and control would seem to be a strong candidate for transformational change. Over the years, NRC has struggled with this complex set of issues. It has proven to be a real challenge to ensure that digital upgrades are done safely and do not introduce any unacceptable risks while establishing a reliable regulatory framework for making these upgrades. Although digital technology has been around for decades and is used extensively in other sectors of the economy, U.S. nuclear power plants still rely primarily on analog technology and components. As a practical matter, digital represents a new technology that challenges our existing regulatory framework. Because digital instrumentation control technology has rapidly evolved in recent decades and will continue to do so, it is particularly ill-suited to rigid standards and prescriptive guidance. If other sectors of the economy or nuclear regulators in other countries have had success with alternative consensus standards, it makes sense for NRC to evaluate whether compliance with these standards could be an acceptable way of meeting NRC's safety and security requirements. On the other hand, I am concerned that a near-term rulemaking to establish this new regulatory framework could shift focus away from the current efforts to improve key guidance documents at a time when significant progress is being made. I do not want to lose the momentum we have right now. And if updated guidance is able to effectively resolve the major regulatory challenges and provide a predictable framework for making digital upgrades, I have a hard time seeing the case for setting that guidance aside and starting from scratch with a new rule. 
Instead of deciding now whether to initiate a rulemaking sometime down the road, I think it would be better to first see whether updating the guidance proves to be an effective solution. Although I am open-minded about ultimately pursuing a transformative digital instrumentation and control rulemaking, I believe the staff should complete the ongoing efforts, allow the new guidance to be used for a period of time, and then determine the extent to which the new guidance has resolved the challenges in this area. At that point, we can decide whether rulemaking is still needed. There are a lot of ideas for making changes to the engineering inspection program, some good and some not so good. Engineering inspections are an essential part of the suite of baseline inspections conducted at every operating nuclear power plant across the country. They play an important role in verifying that safety systems are capable of performing their intended safety functions under accident conditions. NRC began conducting engineering inspections in response to a significant safety event at davis Bessey in 1985. And these inspections have evolved over the years to confront emerging issues and new findings. As the NRC staff's engineering inspection working group concluded, the current suite of engineering inspections is effective in identifying safety issues. In fact, since the year 2000, these inspections have resulted in over 2,000 inspection findings. Most of the findings were green, but several were white or even yellow. The working group explained that one of the reasons the engineering inspection program added value to reactor safety was its ability to identify latent conditions that would not manifest themselves through routine plant surveillance activities. This helped NRC inspectors identify defective components before they failed. So although many of the performance deficiencies identified over the years was, were of lower risk significance, some of these deficiencies would have become more risk significant if NRC hadn't caught them early before component failure. The Commission is currently considering options for modifying the engineering inspections. The staff recommends replacing the current design bases assurance inspection and some other regional team engineering inspections with a comprehensive engineering team inspection complemented by focused engineering inspections. There are, there's an acronym for all that, so be assured it's all okay. Uh, the, com the comprehensive engineering team inspection uh, would verify the ability of plant components to perform their licensing, base, licensing basis functions following plant modifications. The staff recommends performing them on a four-year cycle. In the years they are not performed at a plant, a focused engineering inspection would be performed instead. These inspections would focus narrowly on a particular engineering area, which would change each year. So there are two basic changes being contemplated here. First, a shift in the content and focus of each year's engineering inspection, and second, a reduction in the frequency of the comprehensive engineering inspection. I believe the first change would improve both safety and efficiency. The second change would do neither. NRC would just be doing less. There is a solid safety basis for moving from the current inspection to the newly designed inspections, which were developed based on feedback from inspectors in the field. The safety advantage of the focused engineering inspection is that it will focus on different and often uninspected safety significant areas each year. This provides NR the NRC staff with the flexibility to shift the engineering inspection focus to areas of emerging need as the nuclear power plant fleet ages. On the other hand, Reducing the frequency of the comprehensive engineering inspection from once every three years to once every four years would reduce inspections solely to reduce costs. The baseline inspection program is at the heart of what NRC does to ensure that nuclear power plants operate safely. There is no persuasive rationale rooted in safety for reducing the frequency of comprehensive engineering inspections. NRC should not inspect less in order to save money. Some stakeholders argue that NRC, NRC should accept licensee self-assessments in lieu of independent NRC engineering inspections. They suggest that NRC allow industry self-assessments to replace NRC inspections in other areas too, such as radiation protection, emergency preparedness, and security. NRC should not head in this direction. These are foundational baseline inspections that since the beginning of the reactor oversight process have been viewed by NRC as necessary for every nuclear power plant in the country, regardless of licensee performance. These baseline inspections are essential, and NRC inspectors need to be independently conducting them. We should not allow licensees to inspect themselves in lieu of NRC inspections. We need to ask ourselves, why does NRC conduct inspections in the first place? 
because our independent inspectors find problems that licensees don't, because licensees perform better and more safely with us performing rigorous independent oversight, because the public has entrusted NRC, a public agency that works for them, with the responsibility of establishing standards to protect their health and safety and enforcing those standards impartially. None of those purposes are met when licensees are allowed to inspect themselves. This concept is fundamentally inconsistent with our mission as an independent safety regulator. There is nothing wrong with licensees performing self-assessments for their own purposes. In fact, licensees routinely conduct self-assessments in advance of significant NRC inspections to gauge their readiness. But when NRC inspectors then conduct those inspections, our inspectors still identify issues that the self-assessments did not. The thousands of engineering inspection findings over the years conclusively demonstrate that. Several other transformation concepts being discussed involve different aspects of the reactor oversight process. As a general matter, I would be wary of making any radical changes to the reactor oversight process because it has generally been an effective safety framework. The program is not static. Adjustments are routinely made to inspection focus areas, inspection samples, and inspection procedures. When problems do emerge, we need to clearly define and address them. But in a program that is generally working well, it will usually make sense to address specific, well-analyzed challenges through targeted refinements rather than sweeping transformations. Let me give you a few examples of potential reactor oversight process changes that raise concerns for me. One proposal is for NRC to conduct fewer baseline inspections for plants that are performing well. Since the very beginning of the reactor oversight process, the basic premise of baseline inspections has been that these are the minimum inspections that should be performed for every plant in the country, regardless of performance. So this would be a huge change. I worry that if we went down this road, we would see more cyclical up and down performance from plants. We know that performance doesn't improve with less oversight, it declines. That's why NRC performs oversight in the first place. I strongly believe that we should not do less than the minimum on inspections. Another set of proposals focuses on minimizing the importance of white findings. Some argue that only a yellow or red finding should result in a column change in the action matrix and an increase in NRC oversight. They also say that white findings should be quickly closed so that they don't accumulate and that follow-up NRC inspections should be optional rather than automatic. I'm not sure what problem all these changes are supposed to be solving, but major changes like these could have significant unintended consequences. One of the basic premises of the reactor oversight process is that green and white findings can be leading indicators of larger, more safety significant problems. Pilgrim is a textbook example of that. Pilgrim was a column four from September 2015 until earlier this month, and it got there from three white findings. It didn't have any yellow or red findings, but the white findings caused NRC to take a closer look at performance at Pilgrim, and when we looked more closely, our inspectors found major problems. If the changes being discussed today had been made four years ago, Pilgrim wouldn't have even moved to column two, let alone column four. That clearly would have been the wrong safety outcome. And it highlights the risks of discounting the importance of white findings. I want to mention one more proposed change to the reactor oversight process. Currently, NRC maintains its own independent models, referred to as SPAR models, to evaluate the risk significance of findings of plants. These are separate from the licensee's probabilistic risk assessments. Some stakeholders are arguing that NRC should discontinue its SPAR models and rely on the licensee's PRAs. I think this would be a mistake. The SPAR models are vital tools that enable independent decision making by the regulator. Not every licensee PRA would meet NRC's needs, and the agency's reliance on the PRAs would require NRC to play a much greater role in the development and maintenance of those models. As risk information is used more and more by NRC and licensees, risk models become increasingly critical. NRC experts need a set of models that they know inside and out, that they can modify to meet their specific regulatory needs, and that can provide analytical defense in depth in case there are flaws in licensee PRAs. NRC's SPAR models have served these important purposes well over the years. I don't see the need for a big change to the SPAR models. As we think about areas where the agency has repeatedly struggled over the years and where significant changes may be warranted, I believe we should focus additional attention on two areas, the rulemaking process 
and the agency's ability to quickly assess and understand the licensing basis of each nuclear power plant. During my time on the Commission, I've seen several rulemakings that have taken a decade or longer to complete. I think everyone agrees that this is far too long, even for a complex rule. Rulemaking is an important regulatory tool, and we need to ensure that it is an effective tool at NRC. In some cases, we may use rulemaking to address a pressing safety or security problem. In other cases, a rule may be necessary to allow for greater technological innovation or new approaches to long-standing regulatory issues. We should not allow unnecessarily protracted rulemakings to become an obstacle to getting the right standards in place. In order to improve the timeliness of NRC rulemakings, I believe we should look at what processes, practices, and strategies have worked well at NRC and other federal regulatory agencies and which have not. For example, we should assess whether targeted rulemakings focused on one or two regulatory changes proceed more smoothly than broad rulemakings that make many, sometimes unrelated, changes to a regulation. We should also assess whether all of the current steps in NRC's rulemaking process are appropriate for every rule. NRC's rulemaking process includes steps such as the draft regulatory basis and regulatory basis that other agencies' rulemaking processes do not. For highly technical rules, these steps may add considerable value. For rules that are not technically complex, they may unnecessarily slow down the process. Based on an evaluation of the factors and practices that have been shown to contribute to timely, effective rulemakings and those that have not, we could decide whether we should make any changes to the rulemaking process. To be a successful regulator, NRC also must be able to promptly access and understand the regulatory requirements applicable to each individual nuclear power plant. A solid understanding of each plant's licensing basis is a prerequisite for effective oversight and enforcement. However, because these requirements are often contained in voluminous microfiche documents that are decades old, this foundational regulatory step is too often a challenge for the agency. Digitization of licensing basis documents is underway and may assist in quickly locating records of license requirements. And the staff is looking at whether the task interface agreement process can be updated to provide more timely answers to questions from inspectors about the licensing basis of a plant. But I believe we should perform a, a holistic review of how to enhance the agency's capabilities in this area. To do the best job for the American people, NRC needs to be able needs to be open to new ideas and new approaches. But we also need to carefully and thoroughly evaluate proposed regulatory changes to ensure that they will have a positive impact on safety. That's our core mission and must remain our top priority. Stakeholder feedback can help us to identify the ideas we should pursue and those we should not. So please stay engaged. I look forward to talking with many of you this week and in the future, and we also have some time for questions right now. Thank you. As Commissioner Barron mentioned, time for a few questions. We had quite a few good ones come in, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. You talked about uh, rulemaking in your remarks. Uh, what do you see as the as the current rulemaking priorities for the for the agency? Your your viewpoint on that? Sure. Well, we have um, we have several important um, rulemakings underway. Uh, some of which are currently before the commission. Uh, for a while now, um, we've been working on uh, an important. Uh, fuel cladding uh, regulation, 5046C for those who are really um, focused on these, on these matters. I think it's important that rulemaking both because there's a, a safety issue that needs to be resolved in the rulemaking based on um, decades long uh, research project that showed that some standards aren't as conservative as they should be. But also there's an important aspect of innovation there. Uh, moving to more performance based standards, which is what this rulemaking would do, for this area is something that would um, be helpful uh, in the review of, of new um, accident tolerant fuel and, and innovative fuel technologies. So I think it's I think that's an a, important rulemaking serves a couple of key purposes. There are others. I think the cybersecurity rulemaking for fuel cycle facilities is an important one. Um, it's important to get that rule right and to get that proposed rule out uh, for public comment. Um, we have the decommissioning rulemaking in front of us, um, and uh, that's a uh, very detailed uh, proposed rule that we're taking a look at a lot of separate issues to consider there um, for me at least you know when we started initiated this rule um, back at the end of 2014 I guess um, 
I always saw two important roles there for the rule. One was to move away from regulation by exemption in this area. I don't think it's efficient for anyone, and uh, this rulemaking would be an opportunity to do that. And another important function of this rule is really to take a fresh look um, at, our, at our program in this area. Uh, and this rule really gives us an opportunity to hear from a wide variety of stakeholders about what they think about a lot of the key issues, whether it's the role of states and local governments or uh, nonprofit organizations, the time frame around decommissioning, um, issues related to decommissioning trust funds. There's a whole range of issues that um, that, de that decommissioning rulemaking um, will be looking at or that are being considered as part of that process. So I think that's another important rule. I could go on. There are a, a number of um, key rulemaking matters that are that are either with us or on their way to us, and um, uh, there's plenty to keep us busy for the foreseeable future. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question that's on two ranges of digital INC. Uh, we had two different questions coming at different angles, uh, and I'll read them both, and then you can okay. uh, uh, take on the questions. Uh, the staff uh, approach digital INC common cause failure in a zero risk mentality. Uh, how can this be changed to be more pragmatic? And then on the other, other side of the question, given the current qu uh, questions uh, following the uh, Lion Air and uh, Ethiopian Air uh, plane crashes, the tragedy of that, do, do you have any reservations with moving too quickly on digital INC? Well, um, thank you for both those questions. I, I don't have a fear that we've been moving too quickly on it. Um, <laughs> that's, um, that's not a particular problem we are confronting at this time. Um, but, I, you know, I think this goes back, you know, common cause failure is one of the key issues. There are others um, that have been sticking points for, for the staff and for stakeholders over the years, how to resolve these issues. And I talked about it a little bit in, in my remarks, and we don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this, but there are about, I think, five key documents, guidance documents, that um, the staff and stakeholders are at various stages of working through. My hope is that in, in when, we ha when the commission had a recent, relatively recent, um, commission meeting on, on digital instrumentation and control, I think there's a lot of hope uh, that these guidance documents will really pave the way um, for striking that balance, having the right standards in place so that we're not taking uh, risks we shouldn't take, that we, that we are taking unacceptable risks, that safety will be um, assured as it should, but also that we have a path forward um, for uh, digital upgrades to go forward. Because I think there's a, you know, it, one of the things that's always amazed me about this issue, digital instrumentation and control, is I think there is a widespread agreement that these technologies can enhance safety. They, there are other benefits for um, operators of plants, but there is a real ability to um, enhance safety, to get around a lot of the obsolescence issues that we have with analog. And so I think we all want to get to that destination where you've got um, a predictable path um, to make the upgrades. I want to see whether we can get there on the guidance documents. It may be that we can, um, and it may be that we can't. Uh, it may be that we get a lot of the way there, and we've got to assess what the gap is after that. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, in my remarks, I do worry that if we launch a, a new rulemaking effort today, tomorrow, next year, I don't want to take momentum away from the efforts there on getting the guidance documents in a good place. Um, and I think that is kind of a natural tendency. When you've got a big rulemaking that's going to get started and get going, people start focusing their attention there. Um, I think we should keep our eye on the ball, see how much we can accomplish with the, with the guidance, and then do a gap analysis and figure out, is there, um, did we solve enough of the problem with the, with the guidance, or is there so much more um, that it makes sense to do a rulemaking and, and perhaps look much more transformationally at this area? Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, another question, how do you think more modern inspection technologies can reshape how the NRC regulates with the maintenance rule and how the industry implements the rule? Yeah, I think this is, you know, it's, it's not something I mentioned, um, you know, in the area of, of new technologies that um, could p potentially challenge um, NRC's regulatory approach over the years, but I think it's a, it's a good one. I know it's something that research is starting to look at, questions of, of uh, big data and the analytics right. behind it. and um, sensors and other things throughout a plant that could give a lot of information potentially to operators that right now maybe uh, are, rely on human beings walking around and doing that work. I'm very open-minded about that. You know, I think we, we want to have the safety objectives and standards in place. If folks out there are coming up with more 
you know, innovative ways to do that. Um, you know, I'm not wedded to having, uh, you know, human beings walking around the plant doing fire walks, for example, if there are better ways to do that. So um, we want to be, whenever we're looking at something like that, I think for us, there are a couple things we need to do. One is what's a big part of your job, being ready um, for what's, you know, I don't know, is it, if it's over the horizon or on the horizon or the side of the horizon at this point, but, it, you know, we're, we're looking and we're seeing, we can expect folks to want to pursue those kinds of approaches in the next few years. We've got to be ready. What are the kinds of questions we would need answered as regulators to have confidence that that kind of technology could improve safety? And then we also have to think through, is there something about our actual licensing process or our regulations um, that would potentially need to change if we were going to um, go in that direction? Uh, and that's kind of a separate thing. But also, you know, as I mentioned, can take a lot of time to, to work through those, uh, you know, the, the hard thinking about specific regulatory requirements or technical specifications or other things. So um, we got to start that kind of thing early, which is, what, again, an area where feedback um, from all of you is helpful because if you have a sense you're going to be heading in a direction, um, you know, the sooner you let us know about it, the better because we want to be ready uh, and we want to make sure that um, innovation aimed at improving safety is something that um, the agency is ready for and can get behind. So it's a it's important aspect of this. Well, one last question for closing here. You, your, your remarks talked about uh, transformation, but uh, uh, things that you haven't covered in your talks and in, in your talk and your questions, what, what priority work is in the face of the commission right now from your viewpoint? Well, the, you know, there's a, we, we actually have the, the transformation paper in front of us. We have the engineering um, inspections paper in front of us. We have several of these rulemakings we talked about earlier. Um, but, you know, as the, as the first, uh, I don't know if it's a panel, first group, the fireside chat talked about, um, you know, there, when, when we talk about um, transformation and innovation, it isn't just one thing, you know, and there are aspects of it that I didn't talk about even this morning in terms of, um, you know, the agency's human resources and our organization. And there is a lot we've been doing um, to be smarter about strategic workforce planning, to be uh, smarter about um, how we move people throughout the agency to do work. I think a lot of that's very important and can be very valuable, both for the agency, but also you know, for the employees at the agency who can use those as tools to kind of chart their career path. I do, you know, if I, if something that came out of the first uh, discussion that does have me worried and I do talk about a lot is the lack of new hires we've had in recent years. I think, you know, for the, for the health of the organization, we're going to have to get back to doing uh, new hires. When you hear a statistic that 2%, only 2% of the people working at NRC are below 30, that is way too low. You know, and that's, and it's, we're getting this kind of reverse pyramid where it's been so long since we've been bringing any kind of decent numbers of people into the agency that um, we just don't have the, the new entrants. And, and it's, it's less about age and more about having new ideas, new talent come into the agency. You've got to have that pipeline of new talent for a successful organization, whether you're NRC or any other organization. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, next, uh, our next plenary is going to be from Commissioner Stephen Burns. The Honorable Stephen Burns was sworn in as a commissioner in the U.S. NRC on November 2014 to a term ending June 2019. Uh, commissioner Burns has had a, a distinguished career with the NRC and internationally as well. He was our 16th chairman from January of 2015 through January of 2017. And immediately prior to rejoining the NRC, Commissioner Burns was head of legal affairs at the Nuclear Energy Agency that's part of the Organization for Economic Cooperation in Paris, France from 2012 to 2014. Uh, Commissioner Burns was a career employee at the NRC from 1978 to 2012, and he served as the NRC's general counsel from May 2009 to April 2012. As I'm sure you've already heard, this will be Commissioner Burns' last regulatory information conference. And so he stated that he will not be seeking an additional term after his current term expires. So please join me in welcoming Commissioner Burns. Thanks, Howard. Oh. No card. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Are the slides going to go up? Yeah, okay. 
So I thought I would take you through as Ho's already giving you my career path, 1978, 40 years ago, I joined the agency. Now there's something about that number 40. If we think about Moses and the Israelites, they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. Um, Noah survived 40 days of rain. Jesus and Mohammed both went into, uh, into seclusion and prayer for 40 days before they emerged and carried uh, out their missions. Um, so 40 is something. It's all it is, it's a long time, and maybe it's time for you to move on, and that's what I plan to do. But for this 40 years for me, um, there are two NRC acts and a, one in the middle. So we're going to see, here's Act 1. And Margie, Margie uh, sort of set the stage here. She talked about Marie Kondo, and what I hope to do today is to share some pictures as I clear out my files that give me joy. And, um, and all, this is, this is one, I guess I was a little darker of hair. But look at that modern computer that's sitting on the, on the desk. This is about 30 years ago when I was in uh, the chairman's office working for a chairman. Not, I didn't gray that much being the chairman for about two years or so. Uh, so that was my first act, my first time around at the NRC, which as Ho mentioned and uh, concluded with uh, when I retired as general counsel in 2012. And then I came back to town in November 2014. There's Allison, and in the middle is my wife, Joan, who's joining me today, uh, just trying to figure out what I've been doing with myself for these 40 years, I guess. So over the course of this time, uh, and of course, when I came back into town, I left this view from my office for this one. <laughs> I guess Paris is a little more elegant than Rockville Pike. But in any event, uh, with that in mind, I I'm going to try to reflect on what I've learned uh, and what the fun I've had, some highlights and lowlights, perhaps, of my career, and the lessons that I can bequeath you as wise as I am after this 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Um, when I joined the NRC in 1978, fresh out of law school, you know, dark of hair, as you can see, I was eager to be begin my career in public service. And uh, I came to the NRC, then a fledgling agency, just spreading its wings, barely three years old. Joe Henry was the chairman. The NRC, as they say, was at its beginning. If the agency was human, we would say it was a toddler. And I think, frankly, that's a good description of it at the time. The NRC was trying hard to find its feet, if you will, while it was scattered around a dozen offices in the Washington area. The commission downtown, uh, about two blocks from the White, uh, White House, uh, in a building I'm also told was a bomb shelter. Uh, for me, I was living in the district, uh, recently been married, and I was commuting up to Bethesda where, when the metro stopped at DuPont Circle, and I then had to get on the bus with the cleaning ladies going out to Bethesda at the, t at the time. The commission, uh, the commission uh, again, was downtown, as I said. And uh, so one of my, I'm going to talk about my first commission meeting, barely two, minute, two minutes, two uh, months into my ten tenure at the NRC. Uh, here's the commission hearing room downtown in, at H Street. Uh, and at my first commission meeting, I had an important job as a young attorney with a rigorous education, uh, a great background. I had the privilege of flipping the presentation slides for the overhead projector um, at that. Now, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about because you're... <laughs> You're used to PowerPoint. And yes, you know, when we said cut and paste, and you do that on your computer, we used to actually cut and paste. That, that, was, a, that was a way to make sure people didn't comment on your documents too much, because uh, they didn't want to go on. So the commission met in those days in a long, narrow room, kind of dark, instead of the amphitheater that you're all used to today with, with the, uh, the commission. However, there's one, uh, uh, the, um, the one of the things that is constant is actually the commission table. So we still sit around the table that the commission was using that 40 years ago. I remember uh, Admiral Zeck, when he was chairman, 
uh, was uh, there was some proposal to do, can you imagine this, in 1988, digitize the commission's hearing table or whatever. But the cost was some astronomical amount, and he said, heck no. And the admiral uh, basically said, we're taking the table up to Rockville. And that's where it came in, in 1988. So in any event, I hardly could believe that I would go from flipping transparency slides in 1978 to eventually becoming a commissioner and sitting as chair at that table and sitting as a commissioner as I do today. That's something I didn't expect in my career. So what would I say is the lessons learned from all of that commission meeting in my early days at the NRC? And it's probably not a surprising one. It's that I think we work better and that we communicate better when we are, in fact, together. And the consolidation of the NRC's headquarters in 1988 was a significant ac accomplishment. It took a while uh, to get there. But we were no longer spread out, taking shuttle buses, trying to figure out how to get downtown. Uh, the communication among us, uh, at the, both at the commission level and at the staff level, was, was greatly improved. So, as a law young lawyer, it says it was not my job simply to sit in the office and expound on the great things I had learned in those three years of law school. I needed to do some other things. And I want to tell you about some of my journeys. And it wasn't sometimes the work that was so much interesting. It was those side things that just happened to hap occur. One of them happened in 1980, and I got to go to the Iowa State uh, Fair. Why? because I had, was representing the agency in an Iowa State Commerce Commission proceeding that we got dragged into, because I hate to say it, our, our management in Region 3 didn't think at that time to call the lawyers and see whether we ought to be pulled into a Commerce Commission hearing. So I was out there to represent two of our inspectors who were called to testify. Well, this is one of these contentious things where between the, the uh, basically the utility and the Public Service Commission is about who is going to pay for some repair work that had been done. Uh, and it seemed like actually they started coming close to a uh, settlement. So the judge, or basically the commission at the time, decided to suspend the hearing for a day. Well, we're not going to fly back to Washington or Chicago, so what else could we do? We went to the Iowa State Fair. We had a great steak. We saw the animals. We saw the fruits and vegetables. So anyway, you take your adventures as they can come. Now another one, here's me in Billings, Montana, also in 1985, a few years later. Um, and uh, one, one of these things, the, the, the point on this one was, we went out to Billings, Montana, because we had a well logger who was storing uh, its sources in a facility that it was not authorized to do. Uh, it wasn't reporting things under 10 CFR Part 150. For those of you who don't know, that's the reciprocity provisions with our agreement states. So the agency imposed an $1,800 fine. Now, the guy asked for a hearing. The well logger asked for a hearing. And I figured eventually it took us $6,000 to go prosecute the civil penalty case and, and to recover it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think it was worth it. And it was both definitely worth it because what this agency has to do sometimes is stand up for the requirements it imposes and to assure that the safety requirements and the obligations of a licensee are met. But in the meantime, when the hearing was over, I got to go up on the overlooking uh, billings up to Boot Hill Cemetery and have my picture taken by my co-counsel whose uh, reflection you can see there, or shadow you can see there. One other one I want to mention. <laughs> now, th this is not the Lacrosse boiling water reactor. I want, <laughs> I want you to remember. But I did get to see the Heilemann six-pack in Lacrosse, the world's biggest six-pack. And if you're interested, one person could get a six-pack of a day for 3,351 years. That's what it says on the back of the postcard. Now, why was I in lacrosse? 
Well, I was in La Crosse because, again, as part of our oversight and, for, and enforcement activities, I was there because there were some questions about whether the seismic profile for the, for the LAC bar, as we used to call it, uh, was sufficient after, uh, in the time. And there was a wound up being the, the, uh, the, the licensee wound up eventually doing the, t the test, the soil liquefaction test that we wanted them to do. Uh, but in the, in the meantime, a hearing had been requested by local uh, public interest groups, so we went out to, to La Crosse to conduct that hearing. Uh, eventually, we decided that uh, what the licensee had done was fine. But again, you've got to find adventures. And, and going to the La Crosse six-pack and actually seeing, you could see the reactor from the top of the brewery, um, and that was even, that's before they served you at the very end. So I want to take one one maybe a little more serious. So one of the uh, actually most interesting things I uh, had done in my career uh, as, as a lawyer uh, on the staff was I wound up going to the Davis-Bessey plant for eight days, sort of at a drop of a hat. Basically what happened is there was a loss of uh, feed water uh, transient in June 1980, in June 1985, probably the most significant, one of the most significant, if not the most significant transient that ha had happened since the Three Mile Island accident. Um, and at that point, the agency was standing up its fledgling incident investigation program. This was something that actually came out of the recommendations from the Three Mile Island reviews. Uh, and it, the agency is really trying to, as they say at that point, still getting its feet on the uh, ground in terms of things like evaluating operating experience, understanding uh, human, be uh, human behavior, uh, human actions. And so this was an important investigation. But what happened, licensees started lawyering up. And so if they're going to lawyer up, we were going to lawyer up. And my uh, problem was I was in the office too late that day, so I got a trip to Toledo starting the next morning. But all kidding aside, I found this, uh, again, one of the most interesting things I ever did because it really had me working very closely with our technical staff and really getting an idea of, of really seeing firsthand how they approach issues, the, the seriousness with, with, and respect what they had for licensee uh, staff uh, and operators, but going through and methodically evaluating and considering what had happened during this transient. Uh, what, what, what were the things that the operators saw? What got in their way? And I have to say, I also had a lot of respect for the operators because although they had made some mistakes, the, the people in the control room and the aux operators recovered and stopped this transient from becoming a really worse event. Uh, they, in, in terms of uh, figuring out what they had done wrong, taking the steps uh, to correct it, and also owning up, owning up to it. So I really look at this as one of the most uh, significant events that, that I had had a, um, a role in uh, during the early part of my career. I want to also, uh, as an early part of my career, I started to do a lot more international uh, engagement and international travel. Uh, this is one I got to go, that's actually Ambassador Walcott in the middle there, who's now our representative for the United States at the mission in, in Vienna. And I got to accompany her uh, into Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Thailand in, in 2008 as part of a, a mission to talk about things like the 123 agreements uh, the, and the potential uh, assistance the United States might be able to offer should those countries have pursued uh, a new build. Uh, you're seeing a reactor built by General Atomics in the late 1950s, defueled in the 1960s because there were some other things going on in Vietnam, and eventually refueled by the Russians after uh, the Vietnam conflict came to, came to an end. I also got to do a, lot, uh, some, a certain amount of travel as part of one of the things I really enjoy, and that is uh, education in nuclear regulation and nuclear law. That got me to uh, Amman, Jordan with a group um, 
uh, of, of people from the North, a North Africa and the Gulf states. Actually, one of them is actually Farouk El Tawila right there in the middle, who used to work at the NRC, was working with the UAE at the time. But one of the great things, I got to do a side trip there. I got to go to Petra. And believe it or not, I had taken some marshmallow peeps with me. Now, some of my international friends are going to say, what is a peep? It is a marshmallow, those little things up there, those are marshmallow candies. And they become very, fa very famous. So I took them along. I took this in front of the, the famous treasury in Petra that was in the, uh, one of the Raiders of the, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie. Uh, and I, I won a prize from National Geographic. So I got a free magazine subscription. And they even, Kathy Lee Gifford actually even mentioned it on the Today Show. Um, so, you know, why wouldn't I work here? <laughs> but I want to talk about some other uh, travel, too, and more recently. Uh, I really enjoyed, as a commissioner and as chairman, going around, meeting with my colleagues around the world. And it's taken me to some fantastic places. The, the Rock Laboratory in Sweden and the Finnish Repository, uh, going 450 meters or more under the Earth. Uh, is really quite of an experience, kind of a weird feeling you get. Um, in, into India to see the power stations there and their laboratories. This is me scramming the reactor in Prague. Now, don't, you know, I, they told me to do it, so don't, you know, don't hold it against me. Um, one of the other things, too, I got to go to Korea last year, and for me, also to go to the demilitarized uh, zone. Here's the general who's in charge of the three uh, different forces in, in, in Korea. But one of the things that was very meaningful for me is because I, when I was born in New York City in 1953, my father was in Korea uh, during, the, during the Korean conflict. That's him on the left there. Um, and he was responsible for the engineering detail that built the hut in which the armistice agreement was signed in, 1950, uh, in 1953, and of course, of which there's been a lot more talk most recently with the president's uh, visits to, uh, to Korea, um, and uh, uh, his visits to Korea and the question of further demilitarization or denuclearization uh, in the Korean, uh, Korean Peninsula. One of the other things I've done, too, this, this past year was go to Chernobyl. Um, I, I visited the Fukushima site uh, in, in about four years ago. It had been to Three Mile Island, but I had wanted to go to Chernobyl, really, because this accident really is something, uh, not only a tragedy, uh, which we wish would have never occurred and we work to prevent for the future, but also because it really is the catalyst for the international framework. Uh, for for uh, nuclear uh, nuclear safety, uh, and it was important to see see this and the cooperation that's gone on between the European Union, the United States, other countries, Japan, other countries, to build this uh, the new safe confinement. Really, an, an incredible achievement. And there you see in the background me, me on the right there, and two of my staff me members with me. Uh, you see the the. Uh, uh, the ruined uh, uh, Unit 4 where the accident uh, occurred in 1986. But it's not all about international travel. We do things here at home, and obviously the most important part of our, our work is our domestic responsibilities for oversight and regulation and licensing uh, within the United States. So I've always thought it's also important to get out and see what we regulate. I will give my colleague, Chairman Savinicki, credit, because she's hit every one of the plants. I haven't been able to do that. Uh, but the ones I have, I, I've been able to see a lot. And it is important from my standpoint to do that, because it gives us a better understanding uh, of what we're regulating, what some of the issues are, uh, and to try to understand. So I've been out there, some power reactors, obviously, some research facilities, the construction sites. This is me at Vogel just a couple weeks ago. Um, the control rooms, I'm not scramming that one. I think that's a, I think that's a simulator as it is. Um, out, up here, I think that's up in Canada um, at Darlington. And also hospitals and materials licensees. 
Um, I think this is the one where I'm actually uh, trying to do the mock implant of the uh, seeds for prostrate thing. It says, I'm not a doctor. I know why it became a lawyer. I'm, and that's not, that's not for me. And here, here we are looking at pebble, uh, pebble bed down at Texas A&M. Um, I want to talk about a couple other things. One, one thing, this is kind of ironic because uh, we're very close on the reissuance of the Seabrook, uh, Seabrook license. But I'll, I'll talk about one of the things I, uh, I will take credit for, and that is back uh, in 1990 um, when, uh, when the Seabrook license was coming up before the commission. And there was a planned protest in front of the, the, the uh, White Flint building uh, that we knew about. And the question was, we didn't know how many people would show up for it. Now, back, at then, back then, the, the bottom of the building at White Flint was actually pretty open. You could, you could more or less walk in. There were, pre there were pretensions that the operator of the cafeterias thought that people would just come in off the street and eat in, in one of our... Uh, little cafeterias or uh, uh, sandwich shops or whatever. So the staff decided, says, we're not going to have the building open because, you know, bathroom access and things, because, you know, people might want to use the bathroom or something like that. So we were, there was a conundrum. And at that time, I was the executive assistant to Chairman Carr, and the important decision I had to make whether was to give the staff go-ahead to rent 10 porta-potties for the white, for, to put on the White Flint uh, campus. Uh, we did, we approved it, and I think we wound up being so generous that everybody here in this picture, which was the full extent of the protest that day, everybody had a porta potty. So um, that, those are great things. But what I want to say with that is um, What's my takeaway here? Obviously, NRC operates in a, an area, uh, area, arena that's inherently controversial. You know, we have a right in this country to debate, to raise our voices, and to have a voice, even to protest, is, uh, is not something that we should take uh, lightly or, or dispel lightly. Uh, it doesn't mean you can throw uh, compost at people. Uh, like we've had a problem with in a, in a couple cir circumstances, and we need to be respectful of each other. Uh, but we as members of the commission are here to hear, the, uh, listen to, and weigh external opinions, uh, and then make safety and security decisions as we're called upon to do. And knowing that sometimes we're not going to keep everybody happy, and that's, but that's the case. Uh, that's the, the democracy we live in. I'll just share a few other things. 2011, Atomic Cupcakes. This is at the National Press Club. I think when uh, then Chairman Yatsko was talking about uh, the, uh, you know, Fuka, Fukushima. Talk about the tackiest thing you could do, uh, given the subject matter. But the cupcakes were pretty good. <laughs> and I, then, of course, through my years, I've had impeccable fashion sense. You know, here's, a, you know, this is what I wear in the office every day. Um, Sometimes we have celebrations, and I've been happy to to wear my kurta that I bought in India a few years ago at our uh, annual Diwali celebration. And this, is, this was just a great picture with my, our, our Ukrainian um, counterpart uh, this, past, this past year in the Ukraine. And of course, for a long time, and a lot of people in the general council, I was Santa. And this is my, you know, perhaps my best sartorial uh, composition. But putting, all, uh, putting the humor aside for a moment, one of the things I think there is a good record of is this, our appearances in front of the Congress. So there are a lot of uh, pictures uh, of us at, before the Congress. Uh, I think I had 12 congressional hearings when as chairman and six more as, uh, as a commissioner. And that, of course, doesn't include you know, the, the, uh, basically the one-on-one -on -one meetings we may have, drop-in visits with members. Preparing for these briefings is somewhat more difficult than hearings themselves. Sometimes you go through the mur murder boards, you're trying to figure out all the type of information you think you might be asked or the like. And one gets intelligence. We have, thank our Congressional Affairs Office for that. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's sort of like uh, you're, you're going to get questions out of left field um, sometime. 
but the, the fact of the matter is um, that we're there because we have a responsibility to be responsive uh, to the legislative branch and to uh, be able to answer their questions, to rationalize what it is we do as an agency and, and that we do it responsibly in, in both the manner that, uh, that attracts to uh, th that tracks with our statutory uh, uh, our statutory goals, as well as within the budget that we are appropriated from the Congress. So I, I think sometimes that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, it's not always the fun thing to do, but it is part again what I view as our goals in this democracy, and one of the things that we have to adhere to. Of course, over the years, I think there have been any number of crises uh, that I've seen that and been at the agency that we have worked through. Uh, Three Mile Island, um, obviously 9-11, Fukushima, other challenges in terms of how the agency has performed or how it works. Um, we have to, for better or worse, keep our eyes focused and reflect sometimes on mistakes that we may make. But and over the decades, as we've already heard, I think, from, from the chairman and the EDO and, and Commissioner Barron, we struggle sometimes with the question of how much regulation is enough to be within what we consider to be that adequate protection uh, of uh, public health and safety and the common defense and security. And I spoke at the concept, on the concept at the RIC of the regulatory craft. And that is that our focus on how we best look at and how we best address those challenges uh, that we face as a regulator about giving that balance of finding that sweet spot of uh, really employing and, and practicing the regulatory craft. And I spoke, as I say, at the RIC about this, and we have over time, we have to use our broad discretion to impose requirements that we believe that meet the mandate of adequate protection. We can't be too lax or too strict, whether that's in the security or the safety arena. We have to consider real life and actual operating experience, weigh public and stakeholder input to guard against making decisions in isolation. And I believe we've worked hard, and we've done our best at that over the years. And I think I try to do that as chairman, as commissioner, to, to give, uh, to practice that regulatory craft. And when I look across, uh, you know, the, the time I've been at the agency, I, I'm proud of some of my contributions, primarily as a lawyer, but also as a chairman or commissioner, to things like those post-TMI uh, implementation uh, of safety improvements, the maintenance rule that Chairman Carr was so passionate about, uh, license renewal, uh, Part 52, security after 9-11, and now our, our, now our efforts to transform, as you've heard them uh, in uh, today's earlier presentations. We're here, as I called it last year, reformed and reforming and now we are transforming. That's the word we're using. And I think it is a good focus, and it gives us something uh, not, it's more than ephemeral. It, it's, it's about how we take things on, how we think through things, how we say, not just because we've always done it this way, but because it makes the best sense for safety and for security. And uh, at the end of the day, when I look past on my career, what's counted the most? And I think it's the people. The people I've had a pleasure to work with, to get to know, who have become my friends. They are too many to name all here. So I give you a picture of, of the chairman's staff when I was on it in 1990 with Chairman Carr. I'm up there, second from the left in the back row. And my staff, in the, uh, in, when I was in the chairman's office, many of whom are still, still with me today. Tracy Stokes, Andy Cianci, Johari Moore, Jason Zorn, Steve Baggett, Kathleen Blake, Claire Caspudis, and Nan Bellier. They've been a great help and support to me over these last four years, and I wish them well as they continue. 
as well as I wish everyone from the NRC. I don't have a clear view of the horizon. No one really does. I know there will not be a third act for me. Uh, I'm starting to fill up those boxes, seeing whether they give me joy. My wife is really pushing me on that one. And for the last time, as I put away the books and souvenirs and the uh, memories of journeys and say goodbye, uh, I'd like to say I've got a pithy quote for you, but I don't. So perhaps I should just do what this man did. Drop the mic, say goodbye, thank you for it all. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to walk in. Thank, thank you very much, Commissioner Burns, for those uh, great remarks. We, we went a little bit over a time, so, you know, we went all in on the app, but we forgot how to use the timer, right? So, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll uh, please indulge us, because we do have a couple questions for Commissioner Burns, and Commissioner Burns, it's been great to work with you over the years, and we're going to get comfortable here. I feel like I'm in an Ikea showroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the chair's going to break if it's Ikea furniture. Okay, so, um, by the way, the PEEP reference, I bet that's maybe even an acronym in the new reg that uh, Commissioner Burns brought. But um, Commissioner Burns, this is also the 40th anniversary of the accident, Three Mile Island, Unit 2. Do you feel that the level of oversight after 40 years of learning, improving, and enhancing is the right size for today's industry? Well, I think it always requires some reflection and looking at it. Obviously, I actually had written a, a, a paper for a law journal on the impacts of the acts, uh, of the, acts the three major accidents, TMI, Chernobyl, and, and Fukushima, on the international legal framework. And it, it is astounding to me to read about what was or wasn't going on in 1979 in terms of things like operating experience. For example, the same event that happened at TMI happened at the Beznow plant in Switzerland. Nobody in the U.S. knew about it until we do, did the, the investigations. So what does that tell me? It says, I think we've come a long way. We really started, understood that operating experience, that human interaction, that, you know, the human-machine interface, but also human behavior and thinking through how you respond. Um, I think we've gotten better about that, but I, you know, it, it's something I think we can continually look at because some of the things I think we thought were perhaps most risk significant in 1979 or 80 are maybe not what are the big drivers, uh, big drivers now. So th this is this this is this idea of being the learning organization, this transforming, reforming, and refor reformation and reforming that I spoke about. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And we'll do one, one final question before the break here. Uh, you have it, you have, we received a couple questions related to international activities. Mm -hmm. Can you give us your, your sense on what, what you consider the, the benefits of interna NRC's international cooperative activities to the mission of the NRC? Well, I think there are a number of things. Uh, one I, I sort of mentioned is operating experience. That was something after Three Mile Island, the, the U.S. Uh, push, and actually NEA, I'm pointing at my uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Magwood over there, uh, Nuclear Energy Agency and the OECD actually adopted a uh, principle that nuclear countries should uh, share operating experience. That grew into with the IAEA, look at uh, Mr. Lentillo over there, th that was adopted w through the IAEA, and now th that program is really jointly run. That's an extraordinarily important thing. So that sharing of operating experience. We leverage research by cooperating internationally. I think that, uh, and it's, you know, that gives us a little more bang for our buck or bang for our euro or whatever currency you're using. Uh, and finally, it is, I think, the ongoing engagement um, that I, I really enjoy meeting with our, counter, our, our counterparts. I, I enjoy seeing uh, facilities that they regulate, hearing what you know they see as some of the, the challenges are, and I think that has a direct impact. This is so much more a global uh, business uh, or, or enterprise than when I came in in, in 1979. Yeah, you know, reactors are being sold, you know, outside the country and all that, but the, the fact of the matter is what we hear and we talk about is so much more uh, integrated. And, and I think that's just, that's come over the years. I think that is one of the 
clear impacts of the Convention on Nuclear Safety, uh, and also a lot of talk that's gone, uh, gone on since the uh, Chernobyl accident. It's reinforced, I think, in, in terms of Fukushima, how we look at things. So, uh, you know, for me, uh, having worked here and also in an international organization, I am a big fan, as they say, of international cooperation and the benefits it brings. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Burns. It's thank been you. a true honor and privilege to work with you in your time as an NRC attorney, while you were also the chairman of the NRC and now a commissioner. And thanks for all the advice of the apartment in Paris. Yes. You know, we shared the same apartment, but not at the same time. But, uh, com yeah. but com Commissioner, it's, it's been wonderful to have you here. We're so glad for the rem remarks you've given us and the journey through your career. And thank you for everything you've done for thanks. the NRC, both domestically and internationally. Thank you so thanks. much. Thanks. Okay, so thank you all for your uh, attention here and allowing us to go about 15 minutes over. We would love you to come back at 11 o'clock sharp. We have uh, Nathan Mirvold who will be giving us his special remarks. So thank you so much.